Star Parker, and uh, she has uh, been on with us many times in the past. No stranger to these airwaves. She is the uh, president and founder of the Center for Urban Renewal and Education. Uh, Star, uh, good morning to you. Well, good morning, Tim. Good morning, Jim. Good morning, Star. <laughs> Good morning, Jim. Good morning, Tim. There you go. See, <laughs> how are you, Star? I'm doing well. Uh, you, are you in uh, Washington today? Washington D.C. Watching them set up for inaugural. The whole town oh, is. Oh yeah, she lit just up. sounds thrilled. <laughs> I, I heard the, uh, and this is probably typical for second uh, inaugurations that the attendance is going to be way down from what it was. They're saying that. It's also Martin Luther King Jr. Um, holiday, so it's interesting that it's falling right on a federal holiday, a significant holiday, considering uh, that the following weekend we are going to be here again mourning the death of 57 million mm. uh, due to Roe v. Wade, uh, and that is the 40th anniversary of the uh, infamous Roe v. Wade decision. So I think there's a lot of symbolism going on. We'll see if it catches up with the crowd to get here. But right now, you're absolutely right. There are hotel rooms available. They've, they're only having a couple of inaugural balls. They've been setting up the bleachers for the last two weeks, and it's a very slow process. But I think that that's just how D.C. works. Hey, were you surprised, Star, that I think we've talked maybe not on the air, were you, since the election, were you surprised that President Obama won re-election? No, I wasn't. And as you and I've talked about it going into it, uh, there was a sense, you know, that uh, this was a possibility. I've been watching, as you know, through Cure, uh, a lot of data, the statistics, as well as the demographic shifts. And uh, I actually personally went into all of the battleground states except Iowa. I went into Ohio over three times. And if you're on the ground, you could have tell, told that this was not going to happen for Mitt Romney. Why his establishment didn't see it coming uh, is why we should be scratching our head and wondering where they're getting their information because it was, uh, it's not a secret uh, in the country that, um, that these, the ethnic communities are dependent communities, low-wage workers look for big government, and until we start addressing some of these fundamentals and do make a moral case, this was not an economic question. Theft is a moral question, mm -hmm. and the big question is not whether you need somebody else's money. The big question is, is it right to hire a politician to take it from them? And that's something that was not being addressed and uh, still isn't being addressed. But no, I wasn't surprised at all because I've been working these communities um, and I know it well. You know my story. I came out of that mentality. I believed the lie of the left and lived seven years in and out of welfare dependency. And it wasn't until a Christian conversion that I changed my life. So we're going to have to revisit Christianity in Why this country. Why did that matter? Why did your Christian conversion matter? Because isn't it Christian compassion to uh, take care of people? Not by taking, not from through theft. No, it is not. It is not what we see through this whole redistribution, redistribution model is is rooted in envy and covetousness. Hmm. And no, that is not scriptural. Uh, if people want to be benevolent, which most Americans are that are Christians, you know, we keep hearing about social justice and how what. The whole um, concept of redistribution is about is equalizing the playing field because we want to uh, distribute social justice. Well, if you look at the Christian community, this is social justice. Over above the $500 billion that they force out of uh, just hardworking Americans' pockets to give to these poverty programs that are not working, they're actually cruel to the poor. But over and above that, uh, this American Christian community gives away another $300 billion in this country and then another $300 billion abroad. So we already are uh, part of social justice, but this is not forced activity, this, except, you know, the, the former, the government uh, taking. Uh, but the, uh, the giving is, is not forced activity. This is just decent people in quiet communities doing what they believe is right by their neighbor. And we have to move back to that model, or we will continue to have elections like this. You're going to always have more Peters than Pauls if Peter can steal from Paul. You're listening to today's issues on American Family Radio. Jim, along with Tim, our guest is Star Parker. She is the president of CURE, Center for Urban Renewal and Education. Star, a moment ago you mentioned uh, the we consider this Sanctity of Human Life Month, and part of that is because it is the anniversary month of the, the fateful decision of Roe versus Wade. And since then, some 57 million children have been killed. One of the leading stories at OneNewsNow.com today is about Planned Parenthood. And last year, Planned Parenthood performed some 300 
uh, right close to 334,000 abortions during that 12-month period. Mercy. Now, what do you, you guys want to educate the community about the truth behind abortion, don't you? We absolutely do, and we're trying to get the message out as quickly as possible. But unfortunately, we have a couple of things working against us. Number one is Planned Parenthood, uh, this multiple billion dollar co- corporation, if you will, getting almost mm-hmm. 500 um, a million dollars from taxpayers. But Planned Parenthood has been working our hard hit communities for a long time, pushing a lie that this is a way to escape poverty, is to kill your offspring. And people have bought this lie. Margaret Sanger herself sold the lie through the churches early on in establishing Planned Parenthood so that the black church community, in trying to get to economic um, freedom, if you will, uh, started sending out this message that there's nothing wrong with killing your offspring because you, in order to... Uh, realize more uh, stability financially, you're going to have to have less children. And so it's taken hold in these communities. And the liberals have been there for a long time. I believe their lie. It wasn't until after the fourth time I went into one of their so-called safe, legal, rare abortion clinics that I had a gut instinct way down deep inside that Mm -hmm. there has to be something wrong with killing your offspring. But the message was there's nothing wrong with killing your offspring. So the challenge in it, they sell a message of life in the harder hit communities with our ethnic communities is that they've already bought it. Most black women now are either post aborted themselves and or know somebody that is. We're talking about cities like like New York to where uh, six out of ten pregnancies are ending in abortion. So it's taken hold. So these millions of women that we're talking about uh, having these millions of abortions are in our own circles. And, and it's a challenge now because until we it, or they confront that this is – an area that they must repent from and take it before the Lord um, it, and sometimes even expose themselves. That's why post-abortive ministry is so important now. Uh, we're not going to get a, a pro-life society again. There's a lot of shame. It's a secret mm-hmm. sin. And so until we address that fact that there are so many that are post-abortive, um, it's going to be very hard to now build a, a community or a culture of life. I like the fact that you pointed out there <clears throat> is hope and forgiveness for the women that are post-abortive? Oh, my goodness. It's the fastest-growing uh, part of our crisis pregnancy centers in the country today. We have almost 5,000 centers the last I checked. Uh, many are uh, f- affiliated with, with CareNet. Many are affiliated with Heartbeat. Some are independent centers. Most communities now have somewhere near them a place for women to go to get help if they are pregnant and have nowhere to turn and they mm-hmm. just really feel scared and alone. But in those centers... The post-abortive work that those that are coming in, women and men, are now looking back on their lives and saying, "What have I done?" And you're absolutely right; they're finding reconciliation, they're finding healing. They, many of these centers now offer them opportunities to name their children because I've even met many women. Actually, I can't even say just a few. Many women who say uh, they're saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost now, but they're still going to say they're sorry one more time for that abortion. This is something that is destroying from the inside out, and um, and and it until we as a nation recognize this, uh, we're not going to be able to stop it. Uh, you know, the pro-choice people keep insisting that there's nothing moral, medical, or mentally wrong with abortion, but uh, many post-abortive women will tell you otherwise. Talking to Star Parker from uh, the Center for Urban Renewal Cure. Star, what's uh, what's your website? Uh, urbancure.org. You are B-A-N-C-U-R-E, urbancure.org. If people Google my name, Star Parker, they'll find me, or starparker.com, but it's urbancure.org. And what we do is look at market-based solutions to fight poverty. And we work, of course, in the media. We work in the poor communities. And we work here on Capitol Hill to try to uh, dismantle the welfare state, which is also damaging uh, to those that we keep saying that we're trying to help. Star, what uh, do you think that there's a chance that – the black community will turn around in terms of the uh, fatherless, fatherlessness problem. You're talking about what are you, a, a, well, is it 73% now? Yeah, you know, it's, it's so underappreciated that in the 60s, before they started this social engineering from the left, that 7 out of 10 black children were raised in married households. Today, 7 out of 10 black children are raised in single households. And it doesn't help for this big movie stars like this Kim Kardashian or whatever her name is to be now having another out-of-wedlock 
baby by a black man. This is not news. Black men have been having children out of marriage for a long time. Um, I guess suppose now that it's a celebrity doing it, uh, or, you know, or Angelique Jolie and her little live and lover adopting all these black children, it becomes okay. This is not okay, and it's not consistent with black culture and history. So to get to your question, what we're doing at Cures, we are trying to identify those 4,000 black churches in this country that believe God, that keep polling that they're evangelical and conservative. You know, of all the polling data that we've assessed for the last 15 years that I've been doing Cure, it's fascinating to see that consistent over these last almost 20 years that there is a third of black America that tell these pollsters that they are evangelical and conservative. They don't show up at the polls, though, so they're not counted in the political discussion. But these are men and women who fear God, and so we're looking for their pastors. We're building a pastor community and network so that we can begin to send out messages and counter that left-wing agenda that marriage is for white people, which is one of the studies that came out of the University of Chicago a few years back, uh, to keep pumping this idea into black men and women's heads that marriage is not an important value. Yeah, you know, the, the, until, <clears throat> it's, to me it seems like until that's reversed, uh, you know, where it, you pull that number way back down, at least in the 40s or 30s, yeah. uh, percent of children uh, in the African-American community born out of wedlock, you're not going to have any changes in progress right. uh, economically, educationally, and you're still going to see an inordinate number percentage of black men go into prison. That's because, right, jail, I mean, and jail and drugs. Yeah, and what's, what's interesting uh, is that Daniel Patrick Monaghan, when he was at the Labor Department, Democrat. Uh, actually, a Democrat actually said this when the out-of-wedlock birth rate in the 60s was at 22%. He said, if we build out this welfare state, if we do this social engineering that's coming out of the Johnson administration to expand welfare, to pay women to have children outside of marriage, you are going to collapse this family. And if mm. you collapse this family, you're going to collapse this community. Well, we all know now that he was right. And not only was he right, we're starting to see these same social pathologies in all communities. The out of wedlock birth rate now in the Latino community, because it is also now addicted to, um, to welfare, uh, is, is 53%. The out of wedlock birth rate in, now in the white community is right at 30 percent. In the 60s, it was at 3 percent. Now it's at 30 percent. These pathologies continuing to have children outside of marriage are going to collapse communities, and we can look at inside of every black community and or inner city or rural area and see the result of this social welfare state. You're huh. listening. Sorry, Excuse me, Jim. One other question, then uh, go ahead, Jim. And I was just going to say, you're listening yeah. to today's issues. Good job, Our Jim. guest is Star Parker. I learned from you, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Then uh, I have a question. You did. Yeah, so. <laughs> I have a, let me one more question. Then you can have uh, ask question uh, of Star. Um, this, I, I worry about uh, where we are in America in terms of a welfare state, as you call it, and whether we can reverse this. I would like to think that we can, but w w here's how, and, and and maybe I'm wrong, but here's my perception. I think this is the general perception of a lot of people who would identify themselves as conservatives in America. And that is we've got so many people now in the country who are in some way, form or fashion dependent on federal government mm -hmm. assistance that uh, they have a vote like the guy who pays taxes has a vote. And so if you get enough people who are dependent in some way on the federal government for income, they're going to outvote the people who are giving money into the system, and it will eventually collapse uh, because there's not enough supporters for those who are takers. Now, That's what we saw in the last election. That's exactly what we saw. When you have more Peters than Pauls, you wow. are going to have Peter outvote Paul. we got to change that or our country's going down the tubes. And that's exactly <laughs> where we are today. So, you know, I, I argued that we should have went over the fiscal cliff so that Americans would know well, exactly what this cost of government is in their own paycheck so right. they, we could revolt today. Uh, obviously, we spared them. They just got a little bit of pinch because of the um, uh, payroll tax back, going back up. Uh, perhaps we should do this gently, but let's face it, we're at a critical cross point, similar to the 1850s. We can't go on like this. Hmm. We're